Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through verse 39. Somebody there say amen. amen. Let's read together Romans 8, 31 through 39. It says this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who intercede? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the yeah. love of Christ? Who shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than yeah. conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation yeah. will be able to separate us from yeah. the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. I want to preach to you this morning on these verses. Under the, under the title, God is for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these verses. We thank you for these truths. We pray that you would encourage us as we study them this morning. Help me to preach your word, not merely my thoughts. Pray that I would speak in such a way that it's clear. We pray for your people who are hearing this word today, that you would open their hearts, that you would shape them. I pray for the lost that are among us, that you would save them this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to draw your attention to verse 31. What then shall we say about these things? What are these things? I imagine myself having, having a conversation with the Apostle Paul. And I ask him, I say, Paul, what shall we say about what things? And there's the Apostle Paul writing in his big scroll, with his feather or whatever you call those things, quill. And I, I pull back the scroll ever so slightly and I say, Paul, do you mean verse 29 and 30? The foreknowledge of God, the calling, predestination, glorification. What shall we say about these things? Or do you mean, I pull back to reveal all of chapter 8, and I say, or do you mean all of the things that we've been talking about in chapter 8? The, the, life in the Holy Spirit, and the reality that we still suffer, but we can look forward to glorification. What do you mean, Paul, by these things? And then the Apostle Paul asks me to step back because I'm touching his scroll. And then he, he just unravels the whole thing from right to left. And the whole thing is laid before me. And he says, what shall we say to these things? I think that's what Paul is saying here. Given everything that we have covered in the book of Romans, what shall we say? This past August, Mike Affalabi took myself and a couple others on a hike up Sugarloaf Mountain. And uh, it was a nice hike, kind of straight up hill, if you've ever been there. It's over uh, near Frederick, about an hour from here. Uh, more elevation than I expected, probably 1,500 feet of elevation, over about a mile, so it's pretty steep. There was a few that I didn't think were going to make it the whole way up, but they made it, thanks be to God. And we got to the top, and once we got to the top, we had this 
beautiful view. Mike showed us his view of uh, the Potomac River. And Mike stood on this cliff and he said, what shall we say to these things? <laughs> he didn't say that, but if he did, it would make my sermon so much better. That's the vibe I get when I'm reading Romans and I get to verse 31 through 39. Paul has taken us up this steep mountain of the gospel and we've arrived at this tippy top. And he, he unravels the story. He goes all the way back to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He says, don't you remember where we began this thing? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the, just, uh, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul has been leading, up the, leading us up this mountain of the gospel of which he is not ashamed. And he's taking us through the valleys of sin, across the rocks of condemnation. He's shown us the deadly cliffs of a works-based righteousness, taking us to the rivers of forgiveness and life in the Holy Spirit. And we get to the top of this mountain in these verses and like I felt that day on Sugar Loaf, the view is worth the journey. The view that we get of the gospel from this 30,000 foot uh, vantage point has been worth the journey. Amen? Let me remind some of you in chapter 1. We saw that humanity had exchanged the glory of God for images that resemble mortal men. They were worthless in their thinking. They grew dark in their hearts. In chapter 2, we saw that God judges all Jew and Gentile based on what they've done. In chapter 3, we saw that that's not good news but bad news. Because all have turned aside and together have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Verse 23 said, for all have sinned, or all have, uh, 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 for the wages of sin is death. No, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. i got to get my Romans road correct there. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, Abraham himself. Father Abraham, who we look to with such reverence, Abraham himself was, himself was not saved by works. But he was justified, which means made right before God, by grace through faith. And then we get to chapter 5. We too are justified, not by what we do, but by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who at the right time died for the ungodly. Chapter 6, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Chapter 7, we saw that the law-based morality is something that we do not live by, but rather we live according to a new law that is written on our hearts. And even though we struggle with sin, we have what comes in Romans 8, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we have the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. And we saw in chapter 8 this life that is, that is free to live and to walk in step with the Spirit of God. Now I picture Paul leading us up this mountaintop and now he shows us this beautiful view and he says, what shall we say to these things? I'll tell you what we said. God is for us. That's what we say. That's Paul's conclusion. God is for us. Ken Hartzell of Wheaton, Illinois, once told a story about how he was uh, riding in a car with a friend of his. And while he was driving in his car, he noticed that his friend had a strange password on his phone. The password was pro nobis. So he asked his friend, he said, what does this password mean? And why, why did you choose it as a password? And so his friend goes on to explain that pronobis is Latin, which means for us. 
And then immediately his friend got choked up. And after he composed himself, he explained that he had been through a very difficult time in life. After his parents' divorce, he went through a season where he assumed that God didn't care. He assumed that God had given up on him. And he said, going through that dark season of my life, I found hope in these two words for us. Saints, I want you to find hope this morning in these two words for us. God is for us. You see, life can sometimes feel and truly be a cruel comfort. Maybe you feel conquered this morning. Maybe you feel as if the trials and the tribulations of life have conquered you. Your sin has conquered you. Your inabilities have conquered you. You want to be smarter, stronger, smoother, more successful. But then life happened. And sometimes the words ambushed or defeated describe you more so than conquered. And then, we do this a lot on Thanksgiving Day because we sit around and, and what do we do? We enjoy everybody else's Thanksgiving meal through scanning through their Instagram and their social media. And you look, you, you, you scan across others and, and others seem younger and prettier and more successful and they have more friends and they're more outgoing and have a better personality. Uh, and you think to yourself, you know, not only has life defeated me, it hasn't defeated them. Not only am I alone, they're not. Am I worthless? Am I truly alone? Now I'll tell you where you're not alone, you're not alone in those fields. Because even though everybody puts their highlight roll on social media, Everybody's scanning the same thing and feeling the same thing. Am I worthless? Am I enough? Have I done enough? The root behind so much of our sin is a search for significance, a search for meaning, a search for security, a search for a sense of being a conqueror, a search for a feeling of love, and some of you might say, you know what, in all of these things, I feel like God has given up on me. In all of these things, I feel like God doesn't really care. I want you to be encouraged today. Yeah. And I think God wants you to be encouraged today. As you look at a 30,000 foot view of the gospel message, I, I, I want you to to, to look at the astonishing allure of, of pure beauty and hear these words. What shall we say about these things? Answer, God is for you. Paul displays the breathtaking views of the gospel with five questions that are designed to persuade the listener. Notice with these five questions that we see, there is no answer given. The point is in the silence. Here's the five questions. Number one, if God is for us, who can be against us? Number two, if God gave us his son, how much more will he give us all things? Number three, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Number four, who is to condemn Number five, who shall separate us from the love of God? Verses 31, 32, 33, 34, and 35. No answer is given to each. The point is in the silence. Because God is for us. Let me, let me take these five questions and categorize them into three different categories. Because God is for us, there is no opposition. Because God is for us, there is no condemnation. And because God is for us, there is no separation. 
Let me break down each of those three categories. Number one, because God is for us, there is no opposition. Who can be against us, he asks. No answer. Why? Because no one can oppose God. In Paul's day, there was plenty of opposition. The Romans, these, these Christians that are receiving this, they're literally just coming back into Rome. Claudius, about seven or eight years before, had pushed them out of Rome along with all of the other Jews. And now, at the time of the writing, within a, about a three-year span, Christians are just now becoming, uh, are coming back into the city of Rome. They've got opposition all around. They're gathering in the small house churches, which is a sign of persecution. Paul himself is going to die by the sword within about a decade of this writing. He's not saying that there is no opposition. There is opposition. But there is no ultimate opposition that can actually oppose what God is doing in your life. Yeah. Now how so? Well, he tells us, verse 32, with another question, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Okay. Listen, without a Savior, your greatest opposition is God. Forget all of your enemies. Forget all of your foes. If you don't have a Savior, God is your greatest operation, uh, opposition. You can gain the whole world and lose your soul. Oh, fear not the one who can kill the body, but fear him who can throw body and soul into hell. He says here that God did not spare his own son for you. Your greatest opposition gave his son, his only begotten son. Now, let's try to wrap our minds around this. For a thousand years prior to the creation of the world, God was one with the son in in perfect, infinite love. If you go back a million years prior to the creation of the world, the Father and the Son were one and in love with each other. And even to use years is to speak in human terms because we can't understand the infinite. We can't understand what it's like to, to, to live in eternity past. For all of eternity, God had perfect, pure, infinite Love for the Son. And when that time came, the Father sent the Son to die for those who He very well could have opposed, for those who He could have thrown into hell for all of eternity, rightly so. He sent His Son to die for us. This is a how much more argument. If He did this, if he sent his own son to die, how much more will he give us all things? Yeah. Now, can God give us all things? Well, there was a man named uh, Russell Herman who was 67 years old when he passed away. When he died in 1994, in his will, he had bequeathed $2 billion to East St. Louis, a $1 billion to the state of Illinois, and $2.5 billion to the National Forest Park uh, system. The problem is, his only asset when he died was a 1983 Oldsmobile. You see, your promises are only as good as your ability to back them up. <laughs> and if God promises to give us all things, we've got to understand that God has the ability to yeah. back up his promises. How do we know that? Well, he gave us his own son. Yeah. And if he did this, oh, he's going to come through on the rest. God gives us all things. All good things spiritually right now are from God. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ. One day we will have from God every physical blessing. On that day when Jesus comes again and remakes the whole world and we live forever with each other and with Jesus in a remade world. God gives us all things. He gives us the good in life. 
Every good thing that you have is from God. All right, that degree that you have, the high school diploma that you have, that job that you have, the, the, the warm house that you have, it is all from God. We ought to live lives of gratefulness and thankfulness to God who richly gives us all things. But even more than this, I think Paul is going even beyond the future and spiritual blessings today and, and the positive things in our life. I think he's going beyond all of that and saying everything we have, everything, good and what you would call bad, is from God. Well, how does Paul say this in 1 Corinthians? Paul says, all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or, listen to this, death. All of that is from God. Even the thing that we most dread are death. But that moment that you die is not outside of God's control. And if death is from God. That everything that we dread, mm -hmm. everything that we might call opposition today is ultimately from God. Now, even if opposition is from God, then that means that God has his hands on, has power over, and has the design behind everything that happens. Therefore, what we call opposition, or what feels like opposition, is not. Yeah. It's not opposition. It's part of God's plan. And so therefore, nobody can oppose you. Yeah. You have no opposition. Secondly, because God is for you, there is no condemnation. Look at verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. A little confession. My wife and I were arguing some months ago. And, uh, you know, like most of our arguments, I don't remember what it was about. <laughs> All right? Those of you that are newly married and you're in the middle of a hot argument right now, just know that there's going to come a time where you don't even remember what you are arguing about. So just be careful what you say. All right? So my wife and I were arguing about something, and I said, this is a confession, all right? I said, you know, it is a good thing that you are justified by grace through faith. <laughs> because there are just not many good works. And she looked at me and she said, it's a good thing that God justifies you by grace through faith. <laughs> And then we just kind of laughed, and we were like, it is. That's true. <laughs> this is how, like, Christians argue. <laughs> Listen, we tend to condemn each other where God has justified. <clears throat> God is saying, who, just, who, who is there to condemn? I've, I've justified you. I have already made my claim on your life. I've already declared you in Christ to be right. So who can condemn you? Yet, yet in our sin, we condemn each other where God is justified. In our sin, listen, part of, part of the reason we condemn one another is because we sin against each other. But don't you realize that someone's sin against you is minuscule compared to your sin against God? Yeah. And God has declared you to be right in Christ. God has declared you to be justified in Christ. How does he do it? Verse 34, look at it. It says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who, is, who indeed is interceding for us. Ah, see, of all conceivable, conceivable judges, Christ Jesus. Who is, there, who is there to condemn? Christ Jesus. Let's just pause right there. We can put a period there. If it wasn't for 
What comes after? Who is there to condemn? Christ Jesus. Listen, Christ Jesus, who lived a perfect life, who beautifully loved the broken and the outcast, who displayed God's standard of perfection, who dismantled the Pharisees' arguments. If Jesus Christ walked into this room right now, physically, and you looked at him, what expression would be on his face toward you? You see, the way that we answer that question tells us what we believe about the gospel message. If when we look at Christ, we see even an ounce of condemnation, well, that means we can grow in our understanding of the gospel. That's good. When Christ looks at us, it is with complete acceptance. Complete love. You're justified. Who is there to condemn? Well, I think what he's saying is, is the only one that could is Christ. But Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, meaning Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. We don't stop there. Something even greater. He was raised from the dead. Yeah. You see, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then we would be left in our sin. There would be no victory over sin because the curse of sin is death and Jesus died and stayed dead. No. He was raised from the dead. Amen. And then he ascended to be with the Father and now he, he sits at the right hand, it says, of God interceding for us. Meaning, your Savior, whose precious blood was spilled for the forgiveness of your sins, is right now seated at the most prominent place next to the Father, saying, I died for that individual. Interceding on our behalf. Christ has so radically saved you that you are utterly absent of any condemnation from him. And he is the ultimate judge. So if the ultimate judge, through his work on your behalf, gives you a thumbs up, who can condemn you? Now, I've been preaching to Christians. If you're not a Christian, everything that I say does not apply to you, but it very well could apply to you right now. Yeah. Right now. Christ can be for you. Christ can be completely free from all condemnation against you. He's done everything that you need him to do. He died on the cross for your sins. He was raised on the third day. Turn from your sins and trust in Christ yeah. now. Yeah. And you know, you can be sure right now that he is for you. That God is for you. He doesn't give us a list of things to do. He doesn't give you hoops to jump through. He does all of the work for you and he says, believe, trust, fall into his grace, and God is for you. Thirdly, for those in Christ, there is no separation. No separation. Look at the next four verses, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's, he's asking us to look at these bad things. And he's asking us this question, do these bad things have the potential of ever separating us from God's love. You see, because of these bad things, these are the things that tempt us to give up on God. These are the things that tempt us to believe that God is not actually for us. 
These are the things that tempt us to believe that God does not love us. Notice, even in writing this way, he's telling us, church, that tribulation does continue. We're not out of it yet. Tribulation is where he begins. Life is not easy. It's hard. What might separate you from God's love? What? Would it be distress, persecution, famine, danger, sword, guns, violence on the corner, concern for your own safety, natural disasters, disease, uh, a shortage of cash for food, people who have turned their back on you wow. because of your faith? You know, Paul quotes here the psalmist lament from Psalm 44, verse 22. For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now see, listen, this sermon may fall flat for some. And I'll tell you why. Because for some, you want victory to be fully experienced now. Victory is yours now. Your challenge is it's not fully experienced now. Meaning we don't look and say, there's the kingdom of God. Here's the kingdom of God. It's spiritual. And so tri tribulation continues. This sermon will fall flat for some who most cherish accomplishments in this life. If your chief goal is success or money or respect from the community or letters after your name or having a family or having somebody that loves you, if this is your chief goal in life, this may fall flat. As a matter of fact, it will. Why? Because you don't fully understand the reality of hell and the amazing grace of heaven. If your chief hope is in this world, this sermon will fall flat. But if your chief hope is that you'll be forgiven of your sins, saved from the reality of hell, an eternal separation from God, brought into a loving, reconciled relationship with the Father through Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and Christ then is your chief aim and goal, then that means that even as you face trials and uh, uh, tribulation and opposition in this life, all of these things will be working for you. Yeah. And you are more than a conqueror. You see, all of these things that are listed, I believe, are the reasons that we might give up on God. We're tempted to give up on God because of the hardness of life. We're tempted to, dis to disdain God because good seems distant. But none of these things, we're told, have even the potential of separating you from God's love. Yeah. Not even, listen to this, not even your foul response to these things. You see, someone might say, well, I can still give up on God. No, you won't. Because these are the very reasons why someone would give up on God. And what he's saying is, is the, the reason you would be tempted to give up on God, even that isn't enough. Yeah. His love is that strong. It is that binding. Mm. The list goes on. He says, not death nor life. These are the two possible uh, stages of existence. In life, and in death, you will not be separated from God's love. Angels and rulers, likely demonic angels. Those things, things that are present and things that are to come, meaning the current realities of this life and the future unknowns of life are not enough to separate you from God's love. Not powers, nor height, nor depth. And some days you feel as if most everything in the world is against you. Well, he says there's nothing in all of creation.
creation that is able to separate you from God's love. It's as if Paul looks all the way up to heaven, and he looks all the way down to hell, and he says, I don't see any that will separate you from the love of God. Instead, in all of these things, now he's talking about these tribulations, these trials that we face, and then all of life from hell to heaven. In all of these things, he says, you are more than a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. Super conquerors. You know, a conqueror, uh, you might call a conqueror someone who was able to uh, attain their own victory, but we are someone who has a God who attained our victory for us, and he is omniscient and omnipotent, being all-powerful and all-knowing, and he's working for us. And so it's, it's as if poetically the only word he can come up with is, is that you're more than conquerors. You're more than a winner. This allows you, church, to stop comparing yourself to others. Because you are already in Christ more than a conqueror. This allows you, church, to be able to genuinely celebrate the success of another. Yeah. You know why you so often struggle to celebrate somebody else's success when you feel like junk? It's because you feel like junk. <laughs> it's because you have loser syndrome. <laughs> and you can't celebrate the win of somebody else. No, this allows you to say, no, I am more than a conqueror in Christ. And I can celebrate. I can rejoice with those who rejoice. This applies to one in Christ who has all of the accolades in the world. And this also applies to one in Christ who has been overlooked by the world. This applies to the one who eked by in life, made just enough to survive, was a late bloomer spiritually, never even led another soul to Jesus. That one is more than a conqueror. Why? Because it's through him. Yeah. It's through Christ. Yeah. Don't you see that every response in here, it takes us to Christ? <coughs> Paul can't even, can't even talk about God's love without talking about Christ, the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. Who will oppose us? He says, look at Christ. Nobody. Who can condemn us? Look at Christ. None. Who can separate us from the love of God? Look at Christ. Nothing. When I was a little rebel kid, my mother and father were kind to me. I remember being probably about 13 years old and I was really angry about something. And I was sitting in my room and uh, I lived in the basements where my parents locked me up. <laughs> and no, I had a room down there. And my dad came down, and I, and I hear him coming down the stairs, and I'm like, uh. Oh, my, you know, he's going to come in and try to be kind. And I just want to be angry right now, you know? And so my dad was a wonderful man. Both my parents were wonderful. My dad sat down on, across from me. And he, he played a cassette. And I remember cassettes. Um, <laughs> And he played this song, and the lyrics, it was, it was this old uh, folk band, folk new left, from like the 80s. The lyrics went like this. You were born to me, I was there, and I remember your mother's pain. I was very proud to let you have my name. I want you to know, wherever you go, or whatever you do, if you're the president or a prisoner, you are my child. And I will always love you because you will always be mine. You can lean on me anytime. Whatever you do, I will always love you. You will always be mine. And my dad then re-emphasizes this and says, you know, if you're a president or a prisoner, you're my son. And I will always love you. And I remember just thinking like, wow. My dad really loves me. Because I knew I wasn't going to be the president, and, so I, and I think I'm going to be the president. That is love. You will always be mine. You see, 
it's hard for me to wrap my mind around a God who has infinite love for me. What if I forget that I love God? Because I know some of you, you had high school crushes, you've had all kinds of crushes that you don't even remember anymore. How is it that you're going to continue to love God? How is it that you're not going to forget God like you forgot all of your old crushes? Well, your inseparable love relationship with God is not based on your ability to keep loving Him. It's based on God. It's based on God's unchanging characteristic. And God has set his, listen to this, his unchangeable and unchanging love on you. And it will never change. Ever. For all of eternity, no matter what. And if God keeps loving you, you will keep loving God. Well, what if I want to run away from his love? Oh, I will, and I do at times. But his love always chases me down and loses me back. What if I give myself over to a life of unrepentant sin? You won't. Because you've been given the Holy Spirit of God in his love. And yes, while there may be seasons of sinful activity in your life, where you're trying to run away from God, Romans chapter 2, verse 4 will always prove true, which says, His kindness leads us to repentance. Do you think that after my dad showed such kindness to me and walked out that I wanted to just continue to be a rebel against him? No, kindness leads us to repentance. God's kindness for you, church. It doesn't lead you to a life of liberation in your sin. It leads you to a life of liberation from your sin. It leads you to a life of obedience to God. What if he discovers something in me that turns his love away? Because I know that that's your concern about human relationships and human love. What if they discover this thing about me? Will they keep loving me then? Saints, God already knows everything about you. He knows every secret thought, every impure desire, and God has said, you will always be mine. What can separate you from the love of God? Not tribulation, nor distress, nor persecution, nor famine, nor danger, nor sword, nor death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, God is Father, we thank you that you are for us. We thank you, Lord, for taking us to the heights, the beautiful heights of this gospel message so that we might just stand in awe of your love and be grateful. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we seek to apply these truths to our lives. That we would not seek meaning, significance, love in any sinful way. But that we would know that we are already more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.